Hey everybody, welcome back. So we're starting something new today. I want to do a series on every animal that we keep here and make it kind of short form videos, about 10 minutes or so, that go into different aspects of information about the animal, information about keeping and things like that. And of course, since retics are my favorite, we're starting with reticulated pythons. Whether you're a lifelong keeper or just getting started, Help us encourage responsible keeping, conservation, and public education in the interest of keeping our reptiles safe and healthy as we protect them for future generations. You're invited to spend time with us as we experience these awesome animals together on Intrepid Exotics. So this gorgeous girl right here, she's Monty. She's my four-year-old female Motley retic. She's right at about 14 feet right now and probably pushing 50 pounds uh, a little bit less than that probably i'd say between 40 and 50 pounds but i expect her to get a little bit bigger than this you know up until about five years they grow pretty quickly so um i expect her you know in the next year or so probably put on another foot over the course of the next few years i expect her to get up 18 maybe 20 feet long so it's one of the reasons why i wanted to start with retics because um, as you'll see through the series, they, um, they reproduce a lot at a time. You can get clutches of 50 eggs from a healthy female when you're breeding. And those, uh, those 50 eggs end up going to folks. So I thought there's a really good way to condense everything down into really digestible sections. Um, and we're going to start from when they hatch out as, as you know, hatchlings from the egg all the way up to how do you manage a 16 18 20 foot snake uh, which is all stuff that you need to know if you want to have these guys so without any further ado let's go up and uh start talking about our introduction what is a retic so we'll take a really quick look at the taxonomy here for maleo python reticulus otherwise known as a reticulated python and you will see it's in the suborder of serpentis going down but as far as we need to go is to the family pythonidae and this is where they diverge from other common species that or other common families rather of snakes that we're familiar with boas vipers colubrids and elapids and if you look on the right there you can see the conservation status it's marked as least concern which means that they're not threatened or vulnerable in their natural habitat which is kind of surprising considering that there is a uh, skin trade for articulated pythons and of course there's the pet trade as well but they seem to be flourishing and maintaining which is a very good thing it says good things about them articulated pythons can be found naturally occurring in asia more specifically south and southeast asia uh, we're talking vietnam thailand malaysia indonesia and you'll hear a distinction made between dwarf retics and mainland retics. Um, many of the island localities out there have got um, sp specific morphs of reticulated python that don't grow quite as large. And they tend to be a little bit larger in the mainland. So this is a term that you'll hear uh, when we're differentiating between mainland and dwarf, super dwarf reticulated pythons. The reticulated pythons are classified as semi-arboreal and the reason why they're semi-arboreal is in their uh, juvenile stage when they're smaller they spend a great deal of time in the trees um, up until the point where these animals get large enough to defend themselves uh, from the time they're hatched up until the time that they're a couple years old they are pretty much prey for everything so they spend a lot of time seeking refuge in the trees and as reticulated pythons get older and larger they tend to become much more terrestrial and spend less time up in the trees when we're talking about reproduction reticulated pythons are egg laying or oviparous you can see here this is a mama retic with her clutch of eggs and i would venture to guess there's probably 40 to 50 eggs there that is a really big clutch they reproduce um, a lot of offspring at one time and they will spend a great deal of time incubating those eggs themselves um, in order to maintain the temperature oftentimes they'll leave their nest their den and go sun themselves warm their bodies and then come back to the nest to um, wrap back around the clutch of eggs so that they can help maintain the temperature now the fact that reticulated pythons will 
stay with their clutch can complicate things for retic breeders um, because once that snake has laid their clutch of eggs now the the keeper the breeder has to be able to go in there and retrieve those so they can get them in an incubator and increase the uh, increase the chances that more of those eggs will survive and retics come into the world at between 18 24 inches typically and as you can see here they hatch out of the eggs naturally defensive and will start to seek refuge and hunt on their own and they are pretty much on their own from that point forward you can see this is a gorgeous animal and can see why these are so popular in the pet trade but folks starting off with a two three foot retic now eventually many reticulated pythons are going to end up looking like this this is an example of a 19 foot reticulated python in captivity that's right around 200 pounds but I think this picture does a lot better of putting into scale how big a full-grown mainland reticulated python can get they're very very impressive animals although you'll hear the rumors and the myths about the 30 40 foot snakes out in the wild fortunately this isn't something that happens now reticulated pythons are non-venomous constrictors meaning that the way they obtain their prey is by coiling them and constricting their prey item uh, in order to restrict blood flow and respiration until the animal dies and then they will commence to consuming that animal whole as you can see here with this African rock python and again here with the reticulated python they have a very unique skull structure and jaw structure that there tends to be some misconceptions about a lot of people think that they will unhinge their jaws in order to get around prey items that are larger than their heads but in fact there's a little bit more complex than that this right here you can see how they're able to catch and control their prey they've got six rows of recurved teeth that allow them to stay latched onto their prey long enough to throw their coils around and incapacitate them and in order to consume prey items larger than their head you can see here the two lower jaws they're not connected by bone there's actually two separate bones and they're connected by a ligament which is going to stretch and it's going to allow those to open up some more and the myth about them unhinging their jaws if you look towards the back right there's a vertical bone right there that acts as an additional hinge to allow them to open up that much wider and take that larger prey item in uh, the shape of those teeth and being able to move those two lower jaws independently is what enables them to kind of walk their head over the prey item uh, as they take it down into their stomach and retics will find their prey the same way many other snakes will um, it's a combination of the sensory organs associated with uh, Jacobson's organ you can see the notorious forked tongue right here what that does is every time the snake extends that it picks up particles and then brings it back and deposits those particles on a Jacobson's organ so it can detect scents in that fashion and with the tongue being forked in a way that it is it can actually help determine directions and things like that and helps it to track down prey items figure out which side the scent is stronger on so that they can go that direction and then as they get closer you can see on the front of his face there where he has those indentions all the way around is the front of his mouth and down the side those heat pits right there are actually infrared detectors and they will detect the heat off of the prey item so snakes are really really amazing in their ability to detect and track down prey which is absolutely necessary because of course they only get one shot at getting a prey item if they're sitting there or if they're slowly tracking up on a prey item or something as soon as they strike if they miss that animal is going to run away there's no way that snake's going to catch them so they have a great deal of special abilities that really help them maximize their chances of finding and catching a meal. Now you may be saying to yourself, why on earth would I want to keep something like that that has that many teeth that gets that big as a pet? So let's look at a couple of things that 
folks will find really attractive about reticulated pythons and one of those are the different color morphs you will find so many genetic variations uh, especially since they've been intentionally bred into captivity with leucistic and albino different morphs that lead to almost completely black snakes that really really display the natural iridescence on these animals um, the darker morphs right here show that really really well and I've always loved this particular picture and some of these animals can be absolutely stunning and there's other variations like this that are just amazing and just make for some of the most beautiful animals you'll ever see and of course the one saving grace for articulated pythons that makes them so attractive to be kept in captivity is their natural disposition as alien as they seem to so many people their natural state is very relaxed very inquisitive these animals are very highly intelligent for reptiles uh, they rank up there as some of the most intelligent snakes on the planet and as you can see here once they're brought into captivity with someone that you know knows how to read their behavior and how to how to approach them how to care for them these animals are just incredibly inquisitive and really a joy to keep which are the positive points for keeping reticulated pythons and why they're so popular but there's also a negative side to these animals and that is that they are definitely as mature snakes advanced level reptiles simply because they get so big you know he's the super dwarf and the dwarf retakes you're looking at going 8 to 12 feet something like that which is manageable for a pet snake the mainland retakes however when you're pushing 20 foot sometimes it's very important that certain precautions are taken when you're dealing with them so far as having other people around it's very important that that snake's been really well socialized and that the handler knows how to read their behavior understands the snake understands how they think and knows how to properly interact with them and when all of those things are in place and that snake is made to feel secure and the handler's comfortable and confident these can be awesome animals to have around even and sometimes especially as the larger snakes because the older these animals get the more comfortable they get in their environment and with their keeper and so forth and they can be such a pleasure to keep so that's what a reticulated python is episode one of the series uh, we're going to continue to move forward every week putting out a new video that's going to be about hatchlings about feeding enclosures uh, interacting socialization just about every topic that we can think of about reticulated pythons we're going to have contained in this series so make sure you get down like the videos gets it out to more people get into the comments if you've got any questions especially now while we're still in the process of filming the rest of the series let me know and we'll address them directly when we get into those segments and get subscribed to the channel so you can keep up with everything and in the meantime guys i hope you have an outstanding week and i really appreciate you hanging out with me and we'll see you next time on intrepid exotics